Before we begin, uh, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Almighty Father, we ask that you pour down your Holy Spirit upon us, enlighten our minds and our hearts so that we may understand the truth of the scripture that we're about to read and imbibe within our own being. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, so this is the first uh, session all the way through um, till after Lent when I said hopefully... God willing, Father Antonio will come in with his crew and do it. I love the uh, deliverance ministry, teaching us how to live that with the Holy Spirit. Now, the way I normally like to work when I do these courses is I like to start with the very big picture, all right? And uh, because we're trying to understand why the passion, what does the passion do? Why did Jesus do what he did, all right? And if we don't get the fundamentals right, you know, like it's like a ship, if it's off by one degree, by the time you've traveled, you're, you're way out, right? So it's very important we get the fundamentals right. So today, we're going to do a... Is everyone comfortable with reading? If you're not comfortable re with reading, yeah? Uh, just say, nah, and we'll move on to the next person, yeah? Uh, but I'll ask everyone to read, because it's better if you're all involved in that sort of way. Otherwise, you have to hear me constantly. So the boy, the way I like to work is kind of present the, the big theological view, the big view. And from there, we'll start working away. I like to imagine it like a funnel. You start wide and you go narrow. Because when you go wide to narrow, then you can, you know, you've got all that knowledge for so you understand the small details. But if I was to jump straight into small details, you go, what, how is this connected? What's it related to? So it may seem like an odd way to start. Right, But it's often remarked that the difference between Catholics and Protestants is that Protestants believe in faith alone and Catholics believe in faith and works. All right? And that's normally the thing that's been thrown out. Now there's a bit of semblance of truth in that, the arguments over the years and centuries and all that. But it's very, very important that we don't fall into the danger that we begin to define ourselves or understand the faith against that which we are not, all right? Uh, rather than actually studying what the faith is. And you know, say like, oh, we believe in works, they believe in faith, all this sort of stuff. And it's not that I'm talking about there's an argument between us. What I'm saying is, if we reduce the faith to one of these statements, we've actually missed the point, all right? So, in both of these definitions, salvation or getting to heaven is all dependent on me. And it's all dependent on my effort. All right? Yes. You know? So basically, that's a work. And then we believe in works. And it's, it's about what I do. And what we're going to see is, yeah? I won't spoil it now, but I'm going to show you what's lurking under that. Okay? So we, can disregard, so we can disregard it. And then actually, we'll look at what it is. So we do not earn eternal life. Eternal life is a gift. So important you understand that. It's gift, not earning. All right? He's trying to gift you something. And that kind of me earning model, all right, my effort, I call it juridical Christianity. And it's normally a Christianity which is probably the most popular and most incorrect understanding of the faith. If you used to face the faith almost as a test. I like to say sometimes in this, it's like a courtroom drama. You know what I mean? We're going to be there before God defending our case. Do you ever listen to atheists? And whenever they meet God, they say, what are you going to do when you say, see God? I'm going to tell them this. They have this courtroom drama model in their head. Not a gift model, but a courtroom, a court case. You know, and they're going to have this big trial with God. And then what this does is it really perverses one aspect that's so important. 
God the Father in heaven becomes a judge, a watcher. You know what I mean? A condemner. He sent his son because he says, oh, you're all so bad, you need a model on how to live well. Right? Partly true, but I joke. But anyway. But, and says, you know, and it's let us know he loves us. You can say all that. But fundamentally, it warps the image of the Father when you have this courtroom juridical understanding. And what you need to understand is, is that Jesus is actually trying to give us the blessing of the Father in our lives. All right? So, judging, and that's why a lot of times when you speak to Christians, they'll talk about Jesus, but do they even ever talk about the Father? But Jesus came to give us the blessing of the Father in our lives. And it's because this is lurking under the, underneath. So, and then there's this other idea that God doesn't interfere in our lives. He's up there, far away, looking down. And as long as we believe in some sort of way, God will be, and as long as we're okay people, you know, he'll kind of judge us worthy when the day comes. And in the end, it doesn't really matter what you do, because you probably hear this phrase, ah, it's, pretty, it's very common in Ireland, you know what I mean? Ah, as long as you're an okay person, you know? That's it, that's the faith, by the way, as long as you're a good person. That's it, that's why Jesus came, just to say, no. Nah. Doesn't ring as good news, does it? No, it doesn't. And all those people who think like this, and this is, we're going to, when we really get into this, we tend to think heaven is a spiritual place that doesn't involve our bodies. As if the resurrection has no real element. That our body is not part of salvation. Our body is part of salvation. Okay? Now I'm throwing this at you very quickly. But our body is part of salvation. The resurrection. So even though Revelation does speak of judgment. Alright? Is this, the, is, is this whole concept of God who's kind of like a lazy judge who's just going to say, all oh, right, get into heaven. Is that the good news the apostles died for? I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't die for that news. And I certainly wouldn't proclaim it. It's like saying, good news, everyone. God sent a man to teach us how to live well and to tell us that when we die, God will judge us fairly. That is not the message. Christianity is something more. Christianity is not about earning our way into heaven and relying on God's mercy to overlook our shortcomings. This is the bit I was going to tell you. This is paganism. This is paganism wrapped in Christian language. Okay? Paganism, if you, if you go back, what do they do? They sacrifice, they sacrifice, they try to manipulate God, they try to conjole God, they try to uh, barter with God. Yeah? That's paganism. Wrapping that mentality up in Christian language is not Christianity. That's fundamentally... This whole bartering with God, this conjoling with God. Remember what I said? God, God's, God's not trying to debate with us here. God's trying to gift us something. God's trying to say, here, take a gift. Stop trying to <laughs> manipulate me. It's done. Right? And so we get to the really important bit. Christianity is about responding to what God has done and what God is doing. Okay? It's a fundamentally different approach. It's about responding. He's already doing it. He's already trying to give you salvation. He's already sent his son. He's already done all this. Our faith isn't about trying to lift ourselves up. Our faith is about responding to what God is already doing. That is such a huge shift, right? That it may sound simple, but it is huge. God is not far away, absent-minded to seeing how we're getting on. He's involved. He's deeply involved. And he's trying to get us to respond to his love, right? It, Christianity, unlike paganism and everything else, what makes us different is that our religion is one of a response to what God is doing. All right. If you were to jump into a time machine and go back and listen to the apostles, what is the sort of language they would be using? Right? 
This language may sound alien to you, or makes sense. If it's the first time you're here, great, fantastic news, right? If this is the first time you're going to hear this. But fantastic news, because boom, we're going to crack open the faith. A new heaven and a new earth. If you met the apostles, they'd be going on a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation. They would say, a new exodus. And we're going to delve into exodus. Because if you don't know the old exodus, this makes no sense. Okay? A new heaven and a new earth. They would say, it's a new exodus. Baptism. Regeneration. New birth. This doesn't sound like courtroom stuff to me. This sounds transformational. This sounds gift. Eucharist. Eucharistia. Thanksgiving. Resurrection. Read Paul and read Peter. You cannot go a couple of sentences without hitting resurrection. 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 Right? This is what had them excited. Judgment, you know. We're going to be judged on our response to love. Love is everything. Partakers of the divine nature. What a claim that one is. That, that's the one that rocks my world. Partakers of the... That's in scripture. I haven't lifted that or made that up. You know. They would speak of transformation and deification. Not courtrooms, not effort, not earning. The gift of being transformed and deified by God. That's their language. So let's listen. So I said we would have, we'd have readers, yeah? So let's listen to, so proof that I haven't made any of this up, yeah? Izzy, would you read, please read the first one for me. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved? And the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Bam, right there. First Pope said it, yeah? yeah. New heaven, new earth. What's fire in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. What's going to consume the cosmos and transform it? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. What is he waiting for? A new heaven and a new earth. Are we, people here today, waiting for this? If not, why not? Yeah? This, this, is, this was exciting to them. It should be exciting to us. Now, as I said, today, I'm just bang, 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 throwing all this at you to kind of just say, let's have a, a paradigm shift, you know, let's have a metanoia. Let's have a repentance of our mind, yeah? So we're just going to go through this and I'm going to show you. Listen to Jesus speak about his transfiguration. Do you want to read the next one for me? Then about eight days after these days, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountains to pray. And as he was praying, he, the appearance of his face was alerted and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus. His exodus. Now if you go and if you open up, I think, to Jerusalem, it will say his departure. In Greek, it's exodus. In Greek, it's exodus. We, we decide to change it when we move it to English. Oh, I tell you, the apostles and the thing. They would have... Luke wrote exodus on purpose. Yeah? So speaking about... Jesus was talking about his exodus. The new exodus. Now I could go into way more examples on that. Uh, listen to St. Peter on the day of Pentecost. Now, when they heard what Peter had said, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's no courtroom here. You're forgiven. Yeah? And he's trying to give you a gift. All right? And it comes through baptism. And baptism's really easy. <laughs> Pour water three times over a child's head and say, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bang! All oh, that's given to you. Or a bucket. Or a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, gift, Holy Spirit, Exodus, goes on. Next up. Listen to Jesus speaks about his body. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of, of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. However, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Gift. I, I just, I'm going to keep repeating that word. Gift, 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 gift. Have my body, he says. It will give you eternal life, he says. I, I'm not having to do anything here. Who's doing all the work in, in everything? God. My favourite now. Are you okay to read? Yeah, this is my absolute favourite. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that's true, then you may become partakers of the divine nature. Wow. Huh? Yeah. That's in scripture, people. Yeah. All right? From the first Pope himself. All right? Partakers of the divine nature. Our faith is outstanding. All right? And this is what the passion, the death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is ordered towards. Do you see why we're starting with the big picture? Because now we're getting oriented, going, well, how is this going to come about? It's no longer just this legal thing that's happening. It's a gift. It's a transformation. Listen to the early church fathers on this, okay? Oh, the language and the way the fathers of the church spoke about the faith was so different to the way we speak about it today. So different. They were so daring with their language, right? We need to rediscover the daring truth that would get them so excited. I read the Martyrology every day, all right? Every day I read about the saints back then. Mount of saints who went to death, yeah? With joy. How? Why? Yeah? What is it they were? They said, I'm not giving this up, all right? This is the how they would speak about the faith. I'll give you these two. Yep. I haven't got the contact. Oh, that's cool. Say, sorry. <laughs> you can do it, read. For God was made man that we might be made God. Our Lord Jesus became what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. Yeah. Look at that language. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Look at those statements. These are saints. And these aren't just saints. These are like rock stars of the segment, yeah? These are like the top. Um, do you want to do part the next two? Yeah. <clears throat> For the Son of God has been made a partaker of morality in order that mortal man may be, may be a mate partaker of divinity. Mm. The only begotten Son of God, wishing to make us sharers in his divine nature, assumed our nature so that Maybe. made man, he might make us gods. Mm. Huh? Now there's a difference, not God by nature, but God by grace. And we'll get into the distinction in that. But what they're on about is that the inner life of God, the divine life of God, yeah? God's not going to make you a God like him. What God's going to do, he's going to bring you into his life so you can experience God as God. You can experience God as God experiences himself, right? You are being brought into the inner sanctuary of the Trinity. 
That's what God's doing. And it will, this will all unfold. These are not, this is St. Augustine. This is St. Thomas Aquinas. All right? These aren't weirdos I'm picking here, you know, from, from fringe stuff. This is the faith. And it, when we first hear, and whenever I proclaim this, it's, it's people go, boom, that is, whoa, that's extreme. Yeah? But this is it. It's not a courtroom drama. It's the gift of God's own life to us to transform us. And you can know and love God as God knows and loves himself. This is what's on offer here. Everything depends, therefore, on who Jesus is. Everything. Scripture and the teaching of the early church fathers testified that God did not come to test us, but to transform us through his son, Jesus Christ. Everything comes down to who is Jesus. Our faith is the good news of transformation. God's going to transform the cosmos. God's going to transform us. All right? Faith is not wishful thinking. Nor is faith a set of external rules God throws on us. Faith is believing in the truth that God has revealed to us. We're going to look at the two big truths, right? St. Paul says that because of sin, uh, we can't see and we can't understand correctly. And it's like I've said to people, if we had the full vision of faith, when Father consecrates the house on the altar, we would look and go, of course Jesus is there. Of course, I see it. It, it makes sense. It's perfect. But because of sin, we don't see and and then faith causes us to see things. That's why Paul, what does Paul say? We see through a glass darkly. But we see, we're starting, to, we're starting to understand what creation is. We're starting to understand who God is, yeah? So faith are these truths God gives us, all right? That when they start to work in our mind, we go, all right, I'm starting to understand differently. I'm starting to understand anew. It's like God gives us this, these little bits of truth and they're just, they go off like, a, like an atomic bomb in our mind. But whoa, if that's true, then this has to be true, then that has to be true. And this, you know, it's just like... All right? The truth God gives us helps us to see and understand better with our mind so that we can respond to God and correctly, uh, to God correctly, and live our lives accordingly to that truth. So the beginning of faith, there's two huge pieces of faith. Two pieces. Scripture has revealed two big ones. And then we're going to really look at the first one today. All right? We're really going to, scripturally, we're going to look at the first one today. The first truth is this. Jesus is God. Right? God the Son in the flesh. That's the first truth. That's the beginning of faith. That's why Jesus says, if you get this, if you get who I am, oh, your life will change. The second truth is this. God is Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are the two truths. You know the way Jesus says, here are the two commandments upon all the other commandments they hang? Yeah, here are the two truths. Right? <laughs> upon these two truths, all other truths hang. You get these into your head. You don't become, you don't, it's not by your own power you believe this. Right? Jesus teaches us. It's the Holy Spirit makes you, it makes you able to come to this truth. Jesus proclaims it about himself and it's the Holy Spirit who empowers you to come to the truth. So is that making sense so far? Because we're about to jump into the, probably doesn't, but... <laughs> But the point is, what I'm saying at this moment, before we start delving into the um, scripture on this, which is really exciting. Yeah. Um, our faith is a response to what God is doing. And God is trying to gift us himself. God wants to dwell within us. That comes from Jesus himself. God wants to transform us. God wants to bring us into his life. 
God wants us to participate in his inner life of the Trinity, who is a communion of persons. God wants to bring us into this self-communion he, he possesses. Do you understand? It's, he's doing the work. He's trying to get you. And once you understand that this is the great motive of God, all out of love, once you start to understand this, then as we start journeying towards the passion, we can start understanding what Jesus is up to. But as I said, we cannot proceed until we have a look at this. Right? Everything, who do you say I am? Why does Jesus ask that question? Because it's so important. Everything hinges. You cannot accept the gift if you reject who he is. Because he is the gift. <laughs> so, uh, we're now going to look in scripture, all these revelations of Jesus revealing his identity. I love this. This is one of my favorite. And this is only a, a, a snippet, a snippet of all the revelations of Jesus he gives of himself. A snippet, all right? But they're fun. I enjoy them. Uh, do you want to read? So this is when God, you can't, the burning bush. Do you want to read for me? God speaks and reveals his name to Moses. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affection of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, God, the God of your fathers, has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So this is the great revelation of God's name. God's name is I am. All right? The name of God, of I am in Hebrew, I'm only going to say it once because I actually, you know, is Yahweh. All right? And it means I am who I am. That's God's great name, you know? And the reason why Moses is asking that question, because there was loads of gods, these false gods, and Moses is like going to say, which one are you? And <laughs> I'm none of them. I am being itself. I am life itself. I am, I'm not. It's, in a way, he's saying, I'm not them, but I am existence. I am being, yeah? I am who I am. This name is so holy to the Israelites, right? And I'm really stressing this, so holy that they would never say it. So if you ever open up a Bible, do you ever see it has the capital L-O-R-D? Yeah. Yeah? yeah, it's all in capital. What it is, that's actually the holy name, but they won't even write it. So they write Adonai, yeah, which means Lord. Because when you're reading the scriptures, you couldn't say the holy name, right? So uh, that's why you see capital L-O-R-D, all big, because it actually means this, but they dare not say the name. It was too holy to say, all right? Too holy. They would only say it one time a year, all right? And that was at the Feast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the priest would come out, Oh, I could go into details about this. It's exquisite, yeah. But the point is, he would say the holy name and everyone would fall to the ground. Right? That's how holy this name is. The mere mentioning of it, bang, people fall to the ground. So, in the Gospel of John, how is this related to Jesus? In the Gospel of John, Jesus is confronting the Pharisees and all the Jews. And while arguing with the Jews, they ask Jesus, 
if he thinks he's greater than their founding father, Abraham. Okay, so, so you know who Abraham is? Abraham is the, basically, God is, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on him, but yeah, the founding father, let's say, of uh, Israel. And, uh, and they're saying to Jesus, do you think you're better than Abraham? Do you think you're better than Abraham? Can you, do you want to read? Yes. Let's see what Jesus says. <laughs> Jesus replies, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Do you understand why they were picking up stones now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was blasphemy. Blasphemy. Yeah. Blaspheming. Yeah. yeah. And they're saying, hey, but notice what Jesus was also saying. Jesus is basically saying, I know Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> Have you picked up on that? Yeah. They picked up on how do you know Abraham? You're 55 years old. Yeah. Uh, you're not even 55. And Jesus goes, I am. Is what you're saying? God. I'm God. God. I was back there at the beginning. <laughs> it's pretty radical, isn't it? Yeah. All right. When you tap into this, yeah, the old reveals the new. All right. Uh, while Jesus is in a house in Galilee, people lower a paralytic, a paralytic through the roof. All right. So remember, we're trying to figure out the identity of Jesus. And what I'm trying to reveal to you is Jesus is actually telling us all the time. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5, Luke records... And when Jesus saw their face, he said, Men, your sins are forgiven you. Yeah, you keep going on this one. Uh -huh. The scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? All right. What does Jesus do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In hearing this, Jesus responded, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on us to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Right. Only God can forgive sins. Only God. And Jesus reveals this is what he can do. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you know, I could come in and I could say to Jeremy, Jeremy, your sins are forgiven. All right? I know you'd be kind of going, well, where's your proof? And he goes, you want proof? Watch what else I can do. Jeremy, throw down that stick. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, throw down that stick. Yeah? <laughs> the point is, yeah, you know, Jesus is saying, if I can do this, yeah, which is pretty amazing, all right? I'm, Jesus is not doing miracles to kind of, you know, for the sake of miracles. Jesus is doing miracles to reveal who he is. It's kind of like someone said, I could come up and say, I'm the king of England. Yeah? Anyone can. What proves I'm the king of England is that I have authority. Yeah? That's, that's the real proof. So people always go, where did Jesus say he was God? He's doing it all the time. He's, this, right? So, the divine power, I love this one. All right? I love this one. So this is the storm. Uh, this is the, they're on the boat and the storm breaks out. Wait till you see this. I, I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. This one, when I first came across this one, wow. No, do read? On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, 
Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? But even the wind and the sea obey him. Okay. So you still have no faith. You do not believe in the truth of who I am yet. And they're like, Who is this guy? Yeah? See, the, the, the connection is there. The, the, the conflict in this, in this thing is, the, the, the real conflict is, Jesus is like really showing who he is. Telling them the truth of who he is, and they're still kind of like, who is it? You know, like they can't come to it. They just, all right? But <clears throat> Jesus controls the wind and the sea. Let's have a look at the Old Testament to see who else controls the wind and the sea. Uh, so there are too many examples of this, but I chose this one because it's one of my favorites Psalm 107. Will you read that for me? Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord and wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the storm, stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, and they went down to the depth. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and they were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet. When then then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired heaven. All right. So I'm going to do a parallelism there. By the way, I love that photo. I found that one. I love it. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've had Mark's rendition, and then we've had Psalm 107. Okay. So let's compare the two. This fabulous for me now. So we have the psalm where the Lord stills the storm, okay? And we have Jesus stills the storm. Now let's compare the two. Sailors in ships in Psalm 107. Disciples in boats. Stormy wind and waves. Stormy wind and waves. Courage melts away. Disciples are afraid. Cry out to the Lord. That's very important, this bit now. Cry out to Jesus. The Lord stills the storm. <coughs> Jesus stills the storm. Waves of the sea quiet. There was a great calm. Everything God did in Psalm 107, Jesus does with the disciples on the boat. That's why Mark has given us this passage. Because that's why the dis disciples would have known their psalms inside out. They wouldn't have needed books. They had them memorized. It would have been frightening for them to suddenly go, we are in Psalm 107. Who is this man? Because only God does that. Only God does this. They would have seen themselves living out the actual scripture. Can you imagine how... That's why they're like, what is happening here? Has Adonai, has the Lord actually... It's beautiful when you see the parallelisms. You see what Mark, how Mark was actually constructing the, uh, the incident on the, on the storm and the wind. Mark is trying to tell us this. <laughs> he's, this is what he's trying to tell us. All right? What Yahweh does to save the crew of the ships on the sea in Psalm 107, Jesus does to save his disciples in the ship on the Sea of Galilee. Right? Remember, the question is, who's Jesus? 
What's the identity of Jesus? Jesus is going around performing many miracles, not to show off, but to reveal to people who he is. One day he gets into another confrontation with the Jews in the temple. Okay? Uh, Father. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. (laughs) They get it. You know what I mean? They get it. But remember, faith is assenting to the truth that God is giving us. They're refusing to come to faith in what is so obvious before them. They're literally... They're literally saying it, man. You know? There is no way. Like, you know? This is all in Scripture. It's amazing when you start piecing them together. You're going, oh, God, this, this is all over them. This is everywhere. Jesus reveals he has divine power. Jesus forgives sins, which only God can do. Jesus takes on the identity of God by using his name. And everyone who counters Jesus in the Gospels is starting to understand what Jesus is doing. It's a pretty big claim. He is revealing himself to be God. And they're literally, that's why they're getting angry. Because they're going, he's revealing himself to be God. Yeah? Why was Jesus crucified? Even though Jesus performs all these miraculous signs while teaching and forgiving with the authority of God, the hearts of the people who encounter him are stubborn and won't believe. Okay? Uh... So on the night, we read that later. So. Okay. On the night before he was to die, Jesus uh, is taken to the authorities. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and the coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. And for us, if we're not familiar with the Old Testament, right, and we're not like first century Jews, we can really easily miss the whole point of this. Okay? And a lot of people do. And this is in all four Gospels. Alright? He's... They're not angry that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah. Alright? You have to understand that. Jesus is not crucified because he was the Messiah. He's asking him, who are you? And he did, it's all a bit technical, but what I want to, it's because it's all very Old Testament Jewish language. Jesus says, you said it, you've gotten it right, I'm the Messiah. But, let me tell you something more. And then he comes out with this sentence. The Son of Man seated at the right hand of power coming on the clouds of heaven. I'll be amazed. Does anyone know what, that, where that comes from? Ezekiel. Daniel. Ezekiel. Daniel. Daniel. It comes from Daniel. Right? This comes from... It's either Daniel 7 or Daniel 9. I think it's 9. Right? But this... This... Jesus... There's a, there's a mysterious character in Daniel who goes by this description. And this character in Daniel is divine. Okay? So it basically, this sentence Jesus says, I know it sounds weird to us, but when you know the book of Daniel, yeah, that's God in the book of Daniel. And Jesus says, that's me. That's why, if Jesus had said Messiah or Jesus had said something else, he tears his robes. Blasphemy, blasphemy. Yeah? What's got him so heated? What's blasphemous about this statement? It's this line. Jesus has finally, in front of the 
whole authority in front of everyone has said, I am divine. I am the man in Daniel. I am God. Right? And Jesus, by the way, all the time has been revealing not just his divine identity, but Jesus has been also revealing that God is Trinity. So when you actually read scripture, yeah, Jesus is always interweaving his I'm God the Son, but there's God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Right? But we're just focusing on Jesus revealing himself as God the Son, God as Trinity. Blasphemy, blasphemy, he deserves death. Jesus was crucified, very important you understand this, in all four Gospels for, for claiming to be divine, for claiming to be God. And Jesus, do you know when Jesus says, don't tell anyone when he does miracles? He's buying himself time. It's called the messianic secret, yeah? Because he's waiting for this moment where in front of all the authority, yeah, he can finally reveal. And the tragedy, the tragedy of this is Israel were the nation prepared to receive God. And they miss it. They miss it. Right? Jesus does all the signs that they were waiting for. And there's just a hardness of heart that just when God finally does it, yeah, they miss it. And they, what's even worse? They crucify God. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean we hate Jews, all right? Some, some, some said that, yeah, no, yeah? Because what the reality is, so they may have physically got the Romans to do it, right? And we don't hate the Romans either, yeah? It's our sin. Yeah, Jesus died for our sins. This was happening because of sin anyway. All right? So don't think the Jews did it or the Romans. We all did it. Our sins do it. And that's what Jesus reveals. So we, we missed the point. But the high priest didn't miss the point. Not at all. For when Jesus says he's the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, he's opening, openly declaring himself to be God. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating thing. In the book of Leviticus, everyone's favourite book in the Bible, yeah? In the book of Leviticus, it says, if a priest should render his garments, his priesthood ends. Yeah? The high priest, in front of the real high priest, ends his priesthood unknowingly. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah? Something, isn't it? Ends the priesthood. In all four Gospels, Jesus is sentenced to death for blasphemy. Alright, so this is, we've looked at now the kind of pre-resurrection. Now let's look at the post-resurrection. I've got two examples. Mm. Love this one. Does anyone know this painter? Caravaggio. Caravaggio. When Jesus first appeared to the Apostle St. Thomas, he was not present, and Thomas refused to believe. Hence, Thomas gets the name... The Doubting Thomas. Thomas. Or the late Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> Is he? Um, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Right? All right. Eight days later, Jesus appears amongst the eleven again. And this time, St. Thomas is present. All right? Now, now that we've gone through this, I really want to see the sisters suddenly just jump out of you, yeah? Do you want to read the next one for me? Uh, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Do you see it now? Like it just really jumps out now, doesn't it? My Lord and my God. And do you know what's beautiful? To see this last sentence, he says, do you believe because you've seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Do you know who that is? Oh, oh, yes. Yes. It's you. Yeah. Right? So this is it. This, it's you. Like it's directly speaking to you. And so now we come to St. Paul. 
So St. Paul, back when he was a Pharisee, was called Saul. And he hated Christians, having them put to death. Then St. Paul met the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus. And then... Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, this is fascinating, and we'll go into this after we in this detail, yeah? But who's Paul persecuting? I know it's Jesus. The church. He's persecuting mm. the church. How does I, Jesus identify the church? The bride. Well, no, that, but he identifies us as him to Paul. Mm. Why are you persecuting me? me? Mm. The church is his body. Yes. You know, when you persecute the church, it is Jesus saying, Paul, you're persecuting me. Mm. So what we're going to look at, and this is when we really get in deep further on, we are actually his body. Mm. Yeah? We are part of the mystical body of Christ that Christ considers his real body. All right? So this is what I'm saying. So, you know, as I, going back to what I said, this isn't courtroom drama stuff. This is real. This is God. Bring, you know, how do we become divine? We're brought into the divine body of Christ. Right? So we participate in Christ, through Christ, and him and us. Right? But we'll get into all that later. But it just goes to show Jesus is the centerpiece of all of this. Um, go for it. St. Paul speaks to the divinity of Christ. Have this mind young, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So quite remarkable, in this statement, right, Paul is basically speaking about the Trinity. Whenever you read in the letters, you just see God. That's always God the Father, right? So, but he says, Jesus, you know, does God the Father, and Jesus is equal with God the Father, right? But then, but Jesus didn't grasp onto his quality, he and himself. So we have Jesus is God, then we have the incarnation, then we have the death of Jesus. So in that kind of sentence there, when you start tapping into the two major truths, the Trinity and Jesus is God, you start to see what Paul is saying. You know, the Trinity, Jesus is part of the Trinity, but then the incarnation happens. And then the crucifixion happens. So it's kind of like, it's incredible. Once you have these, remember we say these two truths. Suddenly everything goes bang, 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 bang. And you start making a little more sense. So the big thing today, right, is I've told you that the gift, the faith, our faith is defined by, it's a response to what God is doing. In all of that, I love to say to people, yeah, it's not us on the cross. It's God, right? God didn't make us ascend the cross. He ascended it for us, mind-blowing, right? Um, so our faith is a response to what God is doing. God is trying to gift us. It's all gift. Our language is, our faith is a language of gift, okay? And he's trying to gift us himself, right? God is trying to dwell in us, live in us, transform us, all right? He's trying to, that's the big, like when you realize, oh, it's about me, it's about me accepting what, what, you know, I have to accept. Paganism, what's paganism? Controlling, conjoling, manipulating, yeah? What's Christianity? I accept. I accept who you are. I accept what you've done, and I accept what you're doing. And I make myself free to you. 
That's the heart, right? It's love. And love is what will see bonds. And this whole thing of our faith, in order to activate it, let's say, begins with that, I call it the clarion call of Christianity, the great claim. It's why a lot of the early church people were crucified and, and martyred, was for this one claim, which we live freely here today to be able to say, and it's this, Jesus Christ is God. All right? When we say Jesus is the Son of God, we are referring to his place and his title within the Trinity. That's very important. I was iffing and humming whether I should do the Trinity, but it, we go down such a rabbit hole on that, yeah? <laughs> I, and I only have a few weeks, right? It, please hold this statement. This, is, this statement's actually really important, right? So some people want to say, oh, Jesus is just the human son of God. No, 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 that's not what we're saying. We're saying God is Trinity, yeah? And Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, and the title we give for that is either the Word or the Son or the Logos, which means the same thing. Jesus, I love this. I stole this from, uh, do you ever hear, what's that, Billy Graham? Do you ever hear oh, Billy Graham? Yeah, yeah. 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 I was listening to him, so he goes, Jesus is not a good man. Yeah. He goes, Jesus Christ is a God man. Yeah. <laughs> Steal. Yeah, yeah. Isn't it a great thing? People will want you to say Jesus is a good man. Ah, oh, he's a good man, isn't he? No. The prophet. He is the God man. The difference is infinite, right? Jesus is infinitely good. What people want you to say, they'll do this. They'll try to drag you to watch it, yeah? Jesus is the God man. Ah, oh, he's a good man, isn't he? He's a good man. That's all he is, is a good man. You know? Who said that to Jesus? Good, good sir. Uh, Judas. The guy, no. Not Judas. The guy who wanted him to, to be part of the, you know, the arbitrator of the good, um, the estate. No. Share this between my brother and myself. Good man. That, that's another one. That's yeah. a very good example. The one who wanted to become, as did Jesus, yeah, wanted yeah. To, to be good. And he How to inherit heaven. His, uh, yeah. How to inherit heaven. What and must I do? Good he must He refused to sell what he had because that's it. he didn't want to become poor. Good sir, he said. The rich young man. Yeah, good rich sir. Young man. And yeah. Jesus says, why do you call me good? good. good. Who is good but God? But God. Mm -hmm. So what's Jesus actually trying to get the man to come to say? You've, you've recognized it. You've recognized I'm good. But you know from the Torah, only God is good. Connect the dots. Put the two together. And the guy says, no. So the difference between good man and God man is I'm not going to follow. I will follow. Do you understand? So, that is a subtle trap people will try to get us to. Oh, he's a good man. Oh, he's a good man. Oh, Jesus was just a good man. No. Our claim is Jesus is the God man. Alright? So, the truth is, is that Jesus is God. God the Son, come in the flesh. God the Son became man because sin has separated us from God. And we have no love for God in the way God loves us. In the epistle of John, I think it's his first letter, he says, we love God because he first loved us. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, counting on the goodness of uh, Jesus, if you acknowledge Jesus to be good, yeah. and from the Torah, yeah. you, we know that only God is good, Correct. Uh, aren't you by inference saying that Jesus is God? Yes, but the difference is, what I'm saying is, people aren't in our day and age, mm. yeah, when they say Jesus is a good man. They're not, they don't have the Torah operating in the back of their mind. Okay. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say, all it's only he is, uh, about a good man. It's just a very good man. Okay. Yeah. But like Jesus with the rich young man, it's like, go, come further. Yeah. Go further with where you're going. Do it. And he, the guy says, no. And left the way sad. Right? Um, who's next? Ah, oh, here we go. Beautiful. Okay, so now the world that he gave his only son. 
whoever believes in me should not perish and have uh, eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Uh, gift, gift, gift. Just keep that in your head. Gift. Mm -hmm. Responding. I'm <laughs> responding to the gift. Yeah. God wants us to have eternal life. Only God is eternal, by the way. So therefore we have to somehow participate in God's divine life. God wants us to participate in his life. God wants us to experience his love for us. And when you understand this, remember I said at the start, suddenly you come to realize it's God the Father who loves you. People, if I could get people to realize Jesus is trying to give us the blessing of the Father in our lives. Right? He wants to have a relationship and he wants to transform you through his son. Alright? God, the Father, loves you. And we've turned, because of this juridical pagan understanding, yeah? We've, we've warped the image of the Father. But when we see what Jesus is doing, we come to see that who the Father is through Jesus. And then we go, oh wow, oh my. He wants me to be his child. And that's mind blowing. All right? So, God became man so that we might become God through grace. It's an incredible statement. All right? And that is perfect. That's finished sometime. Yeah? So,